When Grandma Rose walked past the store and headed to the local police station, Betty, the shopkeeper known as the town gossip, exclaimed, Well, there will be something to talk about all day. I wonder why that old lady went there. I'd like to find out. The old lady, with a not-so-flattering nickname, was already standing in front of the duty officer, handing him her passport. Yes, I know you. Why do I need a passport? But suddenly, to his surprise, he realized that while he knew her, he didn't know how to address her. He couldn't use Rose's usual nickname since he was on duty, and he didn't know her first and middle name. Well, we still need to record passport details, so give me the passport, he said, trying to find a way out. Opening the passport, he read, Rose Brown, born in 1949. Wow, it sounds beautiful, and she carries herself proudly like an aristocrat thought the duty officer out loud. He asked, so what can I do for you, Mrs. Brown? Everyone in the reception area looked at her in surprise because no one knew her real name. To everyone, she was just Rose, and in the town, everyone considered her a witch, fearing and disliking her. I found a mute girl in the woods yesterday. Would you come and take a look, she said. And why should we bother looking at found girls, he replied. Then please arrange for a car with two paramedics. I'll bring her to you myself, she said sarcastically, almost with a hint of mockery. However, the way she held herself, dignified and confident, ruled out any mockery. The duty officer was taken aback. Fine, I'll leave, but only after I get the phone number of the regional chief in case they don't want to talk to me here. Please provide me with that. We're not obliged to do that, the duty officer continued his line, enjoying seeing the old lady angry. Fine, then I'll leave the person to die and personally go to the chief's office, she declared. She took out her fairly decent phone, quickly photographed the irritated faces of the chief and the duty officer, along with the surprised faces of the visitors. Turning around, she left with dignity. What's this circus about? What did that mean old lady want? asked the man who was waiting for his turn. Why, mean grandma politely asked for help but was bluntly refused, replied an unknown man sitting nearby. If they talk to me in the same tone, I'll go complain too. Wait, you're not Rose. Well, and you're not the president, just a little boy playing hooky, the man opened his mouth to protest but decided to check his logbook first. Towards the end of today's entries, he saw that this visitor was the head of the surgical department at the regional hospital and fell silent. Sorry, I won't wait any longer. The girl probably needs help, and my problems can wait. Goodbye, he left, still boiling with indignation. He was a stranger and didn't know that Rose was not only ignored but also disliked in the town. The old lady seemed to have character and education, judging by how skillfully she used her phone. The man didn't see the old lady, she had entered the store. Standing nearby, some kids answered his question, saying she had gone to the store. He waited in front of the store, expecting to see this exotic personality considered so in this suburban town. This blatant rudeness, even if it came from snotty kids, was disheartening when directed towards an elderly person. Mrs. Brown emerged from the store with a heavy bag. Hello, I was also at the station. Heard and saw everything. Let me take the bag. I'll help you and check on the girl. I'm a doctor from the region. Came to the town on business. Come, she said, handing him the bag. You're a stranger, so it might seem strange to you how everyone treats me. I'm used to it, but today I got upset. I came to a government office with a problem, and they treated me so rudely, she paused, seemingly hiding tears. Then she spoke again, yesterday, I was coming back from the forest gathering herbs. I'm an herbalist. Near the road, I saw a girl lying unconscious. I sprinkled water on her face, and when she regained consciousness, she couldn't stand up. She couldn't have gotten lost, the road was 5M away. There were bruises on her wrists and body, and the strangest part is that she either just remains silent or is mute but can hear. I purposely banged a spoon on a pot in the kitchen and saw her flinch. That's it. Oh, and no documents, no phone. Besides, she was barefoot. At that moment, they turned towards the house. 
Like everyone else's, the house was small. It looked old but well-maintained, painted in a pleasant terracotta color. The girl lay on the sofa with closed eyes. He noticed there was no water in the picture next to her on the chair, so she had been drinking. It was good that she was conscious now. The man approached her, took her hand, and felt her pulse. She opened her eyes and looked at him fearfully. I'm a doctor, they call me Robert. Can you hear me? She thought unsure of what to say. He sensed it, she was afraid of something. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Brown and I are friends, and we won't harm you. She nodded. Will you talk? She turned away sharply, she just didn't want to speak. Are you afraid of someone? She nodded again. The police? Once more, she nodded. Yes, he continued, Mrs. Brown went for help in vain. But if the police show up, we'll say that when the owner returned, you were already gone. She smiled faintly. Where does it hurt? There's something wrong with her leg, said the hostess. A sprain or bruise? Looks like she was thrown out of a car or fell out herself, right, sweetheart? She patted her by herself. Robert asked, she nodded again. We have a paramedic who's good at setting dislocations. Should I call him? I'll try myself, but she'll have to endure it. And you, close the windows, she might scream. The girl stared at him with fear and tried to grab onto something, as people usually do in anticipation of pain. He spoke to her for a long time, explaining that dislocation was not scary, that it would pass quickly, and she would still be able to run and dance. Then she just sighed loudly and started crying quietly and resignedly, as if surrendering to the mercy of the victor. I came to see my mother, and I went to the police to complain about the neighbors who mistreat her. I'll be here until the end of the week. Here's my phone number, call me. What about your mother, Linda? I know her, you warn her that if needed, I'll bring the girl to her. My heart tells me this story will drag on. He didn't have time to leave, a police car stopped at the gate. Mrs. Brown, with slow steps, approached the gate, indicating that it was difficult for her to walk. She left. While I was at your place, she seemed weak, but still, she left. Where did she go? How would I know? And she was mute, she communicated only with gestures. You should have come with me right away, you would have caught her. And now, look for a needle in a haystack. I brought her from that side, there's a big stone there. Maybe she left documents or something else. I don't know, my dear, I've done my civic duty, now it's your turn. Are they looking for her? Robert couldn't hear what she replied, but he guessed that the search was already underway. Elite Dew is nearby, he thought. Most likely, she was taken to someone's data, but who? If her hands were tied, it means it was against her will. I need to talk to her for her own good. She doesn't look like a criminal, too frightened. Why is she silent? There must be something to hide. So many questions and no answers. Let me call home. Maybe they already know what happened and with whom. The hostess returned. They are looking for her, Robert, but they didn't tell me who she is. I'll try to find out. For my wife, Vera, hello. How are things there? Well, things are not good here. I couldn't visit the police and submit anti-statement. What happened? Your wife is missing. And he fell silent for a long time. A whole detective story. I'll come on Sunday evening. Wait, give the boys a kiss. Well, the old lady asked impatiently, the local millionaire's safe was robbed, and in the evening, his wife disappeared. Later, it turned out she didn't go anywhere, she was tied up in the guest house. She was allegedly accidentally found by the housekeeper, who also stole the money. They found her button from a uniform dress near the safe. But this millionaire, Miller, have you heard of him? He wasn't involved in particularly good business before, decided to take matters into his own hands, and locked the thief in the basement until she reveals where the money is. Well, and where are they? But the girl suddenly spoke. I'm not a thief, I didn't take any money. 
But now it's clear to me why they immediately hired me, a homeless and destitute girl. She, along with her lover, the head of the owner's personal security, set the whole thing up. I overheard their strange conversations sometimes, but I didn't delve into the details. I should have, maybe then I would have found out where those damn money is. And she cried bitterly. Don't cry, girl. I see them, I know where they are and your documents, Allison. But for us to retrieve them, it's not within our power right now. My abilities only allow me to see, not to act. How do you know that I'm Allison? People in the town don't like me because they consider me a witch. All I can do is understand herbs. Sometimes, unexpectedly, I have clairvoyance. Like now. Understand, Allison, you are wanted twice, both by your mother and the law. Why did you run away from your mother? And the girl asked with sorrow, and is my stepfather who tried to assault me twice also looking for me? Sorry, girl, that didn't reveal itself to me. Poor you, so much has fallen on you. As soon as it gets dark, we'll go to my mom, it's the only refuge for now. Can you make it? Come on, try. She stood up and took a few steps. Does it hurt? Yes, and you can't walk far, limping is not allowed. What should we do? I can go to the city, close the house, and leave some food for Allison. I brought a whole bag, and I'll find a hotel for two or three days. I think the millionaire isn't a fool, he'll realize the girl couldn't have done all this. Meanwhile, Mr. Miller was interrogating his young wife about the runaway housekeeper. But she claimed she didn't remember her surname, only her name. But you hired her, you were supposed to write down her passport details. Why didn't you do that? Knowing that her documents were hidden in a secret place along with the money, Katie just fluttered her eyelashes with fake lashes and burst into tears. Sitting next to Miller's son from his first marriage, 20-year-old Carter, who found this situation suspicious, decided to start searching for the girl whom he inexplicably cared about all these six months. She worked for them. Katie, on the other hand, he couldn't stand because she indirectly became the cause of his mother's death. Being one of his father's numerous mistresses, his father claimed that his mother died of cancer, but he felt she had taken her own life, unable to bear her husband's infidelity. He went out and headed towards the driver who brought Katie. Tom, remember where you took them both right after hiring the girl? She couldn't have left no traces somewhere, her last name and first name must be indicated. Think. Yes, I think. I mentioned everything during questioning. She said she felt sorry for the girl and took her straight from the street. Maybe you took her shopping, bought something. Well, we did shop, but they didn't ask for our last names, and Katie took the phone in her name. Yes, I think it stayed with her. She recently called me from it. I have this number saved as Allison. I really don't believe the girl could have done this. She's naive, young, and inexperienced. A specialist must have worked here. Carter took down the phone number and went to the police. Disappointed, the investigator reviewing the history said she even called the airport directory recently when we started looking for her. Apparently, she wanted to fly away. When the old lady found her barefoot, he calculated, so, Katie wants to leave. Well, too bad for her. Looks like she mistakenly called Tom and is using this phone for her own purposes. When he returned home, Tom was waiting for him at the entrance. Carter, I remembered. We went to the hospital. On the way, Katie kept saying that after Allison took all the tests, she would sleep peacefully. Thank you, Tom. He immediately called the investigator and told him about the hospital. In the evening, they sat in front of him, listening to all the information. The nurses were interrogated, and they remembered a vivid lady who brought a thin girl. One of them mentioned it was her birthday that day. They found out that only two people with that name had taken tests that day. The second one was a kindergarten teacher, 32 years old. Most likely, this is your Allison, the investigator concluded. Carter noticed that his father flinched. Apparently, he was familiar with that surname. Yes, and it was quite rare. Well, we'll talk at home, the guy thought. 
At home, he directly asked who Allison's mother was. I had an affair with her. The father didn't hide. Did you know about Allison? No, she didn't tell me she gave birth. Maybe you weren't interested, Carter said angrily, having long lost any illusions about his father. He saw through his father's corrupt nature and remembered his mother, whom he tormented all his life. He understood that even as a child. I wonder if he felt anything for Allison. I immediately felt a kindred spirit. I liked her right away at first sight. I'll go to that old lady who found her. I'll find out the address in the village. They say she's a local celebrity. Mrs. Brown was about to leave as she had planned, but suddenly Robert called. Quickly, dress Allison in your clothes. My cousin and I will take her to a secluded place. Now you won't have to go anywhere. Later, you'll come to my mother, supposedly for a consultation with me as a doctor. I'll explain everything. They took Allison to a remote village, and the next morning, Mrs. Brown saw a car stop near her house. A young guy got out, brother flashed through her mind. I'll have to talk to him. Hello, my name is Carter. I'd like to know about my sister. I've already said everything I knew, and now I need to go. I'm being waited for, excuse me. I have only two questions for you. Ask if you need. Why did you feel sorry for her and bring her home? How could one not feel sorry for a frightened, unhappy, unjustly punished girl? Only a fool would believe she stole your dirty money. What else do you want to know? Thank you, you've answered both questions right away. Here's my phone number if needed, give me a call. Mrs. Brown quickly decided that having the guy's phone number wouldn't hurt and took his business card. Carter Miller, she read need a ride if you're willing take me to the store she said deciding to take a closer look at the guy it's straight ahead and to the right i'll show you the police are looking for her you say well then there won't be any use they don't know how to work they lack respect sympathy and consequently the ability even so so they offended you yes indeed if only they had acted conscientiously, maybe things would have turned out differently, but they didn't want to. Is she really the millionaire's daughter? It seems so. I found out about it yesterday. Did you dig that up yourself? No, I couldn't dig it up. Only the police could, but I provided the thread they could grab onto. Well done. You don't believe in her guilt either, I assume? No, from the first day she appeared in our house, I felt trust and sympathy for her. They arrived at the store. Seeing Rose exiting the car, supported by the young guy, Betty felt a sharp envy. Why didn't I find this girl, she thought disappointedly. Rose exited, and the car, leaving a cloud of dust, drove away. Betty remained standing by the window, waiting for customers while Mrs. Brown went to the doctor's aunt to deliver some clothes and shoes. They took the girl in her home slippers. She also wanted to tell her about Carter. She had already become friends with Linda, who admitted that she had judged her unfairly before, not knowing the whole story. Mrs. Brown announced the news from the doorstep. It turns out the millionaire is the girl's father, and Allison doesn't know about it. Are you making this up? Linda didn't believe it. The guy introduced himself as her brother, but I figured it out myself. It's clear he doesn't believe in her guilt. Maybe we can bring her back now. You rushed to trust authority once already. Where was your clairvoyance? Linda reproached her. Yes, you're right. I shouldn't rush. Yes, he left me his phone number. Allison can call him if she finds it necessary. They had tea, talked about noble issues, and Miss Brown went home. She walked slowly, replaying the events of all the days in her mind. It seemed to her that something or someone was missing in the whole chain of events. She went back to the day she found the girl, and for some reason, it seemed to her that neither Carter nor Allison were the children of the millionaire. Then whose were they? Allison's mother gave birth to two children. Miller took the boy, and she kept the girl. Perhaps his wife had a problem, so they resorted to this option. 
I should have asked Allison if her mother drinks or not. It's quite possible that they simply bought Carter for her as an heir, and only Carter can find out. He can go to another city to Allison's mother and try to ask her or perform a genetic test. But it's better to consult with Mr. Robert, otherwise she might do something wrong again. She walked, going through all the options in her head, even the silly and absurd ones. If they take Allison away from me now, I'll break down, unable to bear this blow of fate. She grew up alone with her parents who cherished and spoiled her as much as they could. She graduated from a prestigious university and worked as a professor there until retirement. She never got married, she wanted to have a child for herself, but her parents said that if she did, they would disown both her and the child. At that time, she couldn't go against their will. The lack of female happiness and loneliness separated her from the residents of the village, who, for some reason, didn't accept her, a successful, accomplished person who returned to her hometown. Perhaps the absence of children played a crucial role in this, at least that's how it seemed to her now when she was ready to welcome Allison into her home. A brother appeared ready to take her away. On the one hand, her entire being rebelled against it, on the other hand, she wanted Allison to be happy, and she could only be happy with her family. Having come home, she dialed Robert's number and excitedly told him about all her conjectures and doubts. Call him and give Allison a chance. Tell him that you accidentally found her on the pillow, and then we'll figure out what to do next, he advised. Carter arrived an hour and a half after the call. Both of them started sharing their doubts. As a result, they concluded that Miller was not Allison's father. The test showed that Allison and Carter were 99% brother and sister, and Miller was indeed not their father. But now they wanted to know why Miller reacted to Allison's last name that way. Carter became a frequent visitor to Mrs. Brown. He liked her sharp tongue and wisdom. She did not raise him, and he never, having known his grandmothers, simply enjoyed her company. Having a grandmother, even if not a blood relative, at his age seemed to bring him satisfaction and some sense of security. He was sure that she needed him too. He didn't know manual labor, but he tried to help her, feeling that besides him, she had no one else to turn to. Yet, he also felt that she was hiding Allison somewhere, but didn't trust him with her secret. At first, he got offended, but then he understood that she was protecting Allison from new troubles. For almost two weeks now, he visited her daily and noticed that the old lady was struggling financially. Sweets on the table became increasingly rare, so he started bringing her a whole bag of groceries. He felt drawn to her like a magnet. Allison brought to Robert's distant relatives indulged in rustic food. The elderly couple didn't mind her presence since she, like them, woke up at five in the morning and worked just as hard. She had nothing else to pay them for accepting her in such a difficult moment. Fresh air, country food, and physical work transformed her into a genuine village beauty. But no, she remembered that they were looking for her, and it scared her. Carter received daily reports from Kathy, the driver, about where she was. When he was told that she had been to the stores again, but the driver, stepping out for cigarettes, accidentally saw her at the travel agency, Carter wanted to tell his father about it, but something stopped him. Unconsciously, he went to Mrs. Brown again. Arriving there by lunchtime, he sat over a plate of soup and reported what the driver had told him. So she's planning to leave, he concluded. Probably not alone, the old lady added fuel to the fire, knowing about Allison's disagreements with the head of security. Do you think so? Yes, where would the woman cope alone with him, bustling money? I don't know her, of course, but I don't think she's too smart, Carter pondered. You're probably right. We need to keep an eye on her. Yes, it's too late to just watch. I think it's time to act. Do you think she'll live as she used to after stealing the money? She didn't steal them to admire. She needs to take them and put them into her account or her lover's account. Well, then, we should keep an eye on her, of course. And you, my dear advisor, are not telling me something. Let's be honest. Allison told me that there's a guest house on your estate. Yes, there is, but she told you a lot in a day. But Mrs. Brown wasn't embarrassed. You could put someone in there, 
better a very good acquaintance. Not you, I guess. No, I have a farm, I can't leave it. A reliable relative would be better, a man preferably. Are there any? I'll find one, but why you, my friend, have probably heard that I'm not particularly liked here because of some peculiarities in me. When Allison was with me and told me what she was accused of, I saw her money and documents nearby. Well, then, I'll take them, and that's the end of it. And Allison, will she be homeless her whole life? Good brother, and let the stepmother go, let her rove abroad. I'm a fool, sorry, but I remembered that we have a distant relative, an old man, quite amusing, always joking, never seeing him sad. How far does he live? No, he has an apartment in the center. All the children have moved away, each in their own direction. Carter suddenly fell silent, looking attentively at the old lady who had become dear to him. His thoughts went in a different direction. He wanted her to be happy. Well, bring him here. The three of you will figure out what to do. No, he said firmly. We'll go to him now. Get ready, I'll wait in the car. He quickly left so that she wouldn't resist. The confused old lady quickly gathered herself and, locking the door, shuffled to the car. At the store, Artem slowed down. I'll just buy some mineral water. Betty, seeing Rose in the luxurious car, forgot about her duties, and Carter had to repeat twice what he needed. They reached the city quickly, and now they stood at the door, calling. They heard a muffled voice, just a moment. The door opened, and Mrs. Brown saw an imposing gray-haired old man with a cheerful smile. Hello, dear grandson. What brings you here? And I'm wrestling with a sprained ligament, he said. That's good, Mrs. Brown said aloud, thinking about her own problems. What's good about it? The owner wondered. Excuse me, I mean my own troubles, she apologized. I'm Rose, and I'm Charles. What brought my dear guests to my lair? Thirst for adventure, the guest laughed. Carter, explained, he obediently clarified the situation. So we need your help, and your ligaments, as luck would have it, fit into our plan. Aren't you afraid to live a little in that house where the money is stored? Oh, that will be splendid. A lame, crazy old man with moments of enlightenment. Moreover, these moments somehow come at the most inappropriate times. I agree, living is so boring for us old folks, isn't it, Citizen Mrs. Brown? I hope guys, they won't put us in prison with you, Charles said. Well, Charles, we don't break the laws, Mrs. Brown said insinuatingly. I agree, but on one condition, this beautiful lady will visit me as my wife. Fine, I agree. Yes, it will be more convincing, Mrs. Brown said. I don't think it will last long. And besides, I have my household, Charles asked with interest, in the wilderness. Well, it's not far. When the operation is over, I'll come to visit you. I'll be glad to have you. And what about you, Charles? Suggest something wonderful, they won't hide from the crazy old man. Let's start right away. And with your permission, I'll make a call now. Robert, can you come right away? She whispered to the owner. We're waiting. It's just for five minutes, but urgent. The doctor arrived in five minutes. Where's the patient? He asked Carter, who opened the door. We actually, but he had already crossed the threshold. And H it deeper into the apartment. Mrs. Brown, I have little time. Robert, look at the leg of our friend, and while we'll tell you everything, she explained the essence of the matter. Where will you get the certificate from the clinic? Well, we'll say that it's only for three to five days, and then relatives will come. They have the document, and they'll immediately determine where it's needed. Carter suspiciously glanced at Robert, suspecting that he was hiding his sister somewhere. Robert, claiming that there was nothing serious with his leg, volunteered to visit Charles as a psychiatrist, just to be sure. In the evening, they would bring him together along with a nurse. Mrs. Brown, you'll have to stay here for now. I'll go home and inform my father that my cousin asked to look after the old man until they arrive, Carter said. All right, replied the guest. And I won't be bored, added the host. 
Everything went well. Carter later described how Kat's expression changed when they brought him into the house. However, after talking to the doctor, she even smiled, apparently thinking that this visit would be a welcome distraction. Carter also enjoyed watching the reunion of his beloved grandmother and cousin, whose description could be the subject of a movie. One day, Mrs. Brown found herself at the Carter family's dining table. After meeting the millionaire himself and his deceptive wife, she also met the head of security who came for a visit. Please take care of my old man, she pleaded. He's so unreliable. I'll personally take him under control, he promised. Carter was once again amazed at her resourcefulness. After this conversation, everyone concluded that the resolution would come in the next few days. They said they would take the tenant exactly a week later. Carter arranged with a friend to install cameras in the house. He was supposed to see the reason for their installation upon arrival. The eccentric old man constantly pestered him with questions, but Mrs. Brown showed the locations, thinking that they would inform the police when the first footage appeared on the cameras. The driver, Tom, would puncture the criminal's car tires, and now the D-Day arrived. Confident Caddy entered the house, patted Charles on the shoulder, and said, Well, thanks, old man. You made it easier. Charles happily smiled and said, Madam, I'm always at your service. But now I need to go to the bathroom. With a sense of duty fulfilled, he bowed and went to lock himself in the bathroom, regretting that he wouldn't see the rest. As they got into the car, the couple realized they had lost, they were detained and put under arrest. Charles, leaving the house, hugged Carter with one hand, waved to them with the other, and wished them happiness. Senior Miller was in shock. The next day, he blocked his wife's card and asked his son on whose account he should transfer the money. The son listed everyone involved in the operation, Mrs. Brown as the director, Tom the driver as the executive, Dr. Robert. Carter had no other information about him, and the dearest Charles, who was the only one risking his life as the main actor in such an entertaining film. After that, a crowd of people shuffled through Charles's two rooms. Everyone came, went, returned, and disappeared again. Most often, it was Carter and Mrs. Brown. Then the doctor and even the driver, who now shared the old man. In the end, Allison appeared. Everyone awaited the resolution and explanations, especially Carter and Allison. And then the occasion presented itself. Senior Miller filed for divorce from Caddy, whose case was almost finished and was about to be taken to court. Carter gathered everyone who participated in this detective affair, as Charles aptly put it. Everything ended well, the money returned to the safe, and the documents were handed over to the owner. But the fact of Carter and Allison being siblings remained unexplained, as they were unaware of each other's existence and now were ecstatic sitting side by side and chatting cheerfully. The only one gloomy was the owner of the house. Carter nudged Charles, sitting on his left. Help me out, make him start, he won't listen to me. Well, Mr. Miller, he began, we want to know how it happened that Allison and Carter turned out to be brother and sister. We could have asked Allison's mom about it, but she's not here. So we addressed the question to you, as Carter's adoptive father. I never thought that our secret would be revealed someday. Well, they say that all secrets eventually come to light. Today is the day of truth. Back in the 90s, I was successful and happy. I had a business, a beloved woman, and connections. But we didn't have children, and I still don't know if it was my fault or if my wife couldn't conceive. But we decided to take a child, not entirely legally, right from the maternity hospital, to raise him from birth. My wife went to the village to her relatives for a while, planning to return directly to the maternity hospital. Meanwhile, I was supposed to use my connections to find a child. And one day, I received a call from the maternity hospital, informing me that a woman in labor had been removed from the train. She had given birth to twins, a boy and a girl. I wanted a boy, an heir. The woman told me that the second child had died. Just in case, I recorded her details, her address. Twice I sent her money, but the third time, they were returned. Apparently, she had changed her address. 
I tried to erase her name from my memory, and when I heard the last name of the girl living in my house for six months, I was shocked by the fact of her presence among us and by how fate punished me for this ungodly deed. Now I regret what I did, but you can't undo the past. So I'll continue to live with this sin. In an hour, I have a meeting with the director of the orphanage, and I've decided to give him a significant part of the money. I also want to adopt a boy, but an older one, around 12. It will bring peace to my soul. Yes, a sad story, said Mrs. Brown, but I feel like you're not telling the whole truth. You have a son and two grandchildren. Where did you get that from? He exclaimed. It's some kind of mistake. No, it's not. Here he is, and she nodded towards the doctor, who was even more surprised. A son, he said in amazement. Linda has a son, he asked, and after enduring so much, he fainted. He woke up in the hospital. The nurse, sitting in the room, quickly summoned the doctor. He followed her, looking so much like Miller that even the nurses noticed. And Linda? Where is Linda? was the first thing he asked. Robert led Linda into the room, leaving them alone. Carter and Allison were at the orphanage at that time. Carter was arranging the paperwork for the sum of money his father left for the orphanage, and Allison was standing in the corridor watching passing children. One of the boys caught her attention, his left hand was missing a palm. He walked with a group of kids and seemed to be their leader. Carter and Allison asked the director to let them take him to the hospital and return him by the evening. The director gave written permission, and now the three of them were in front of the Sigma man. Morty, as Allison and Carter introduced him, didn't understand what they wanted from him. So he greeted them and awkwardly said, I wish you a speedy recovery. The unfamiliar man smiled at him and nodded to Carter and Allison. Well, brother, let's go to get you registered. Two months passed. Carter and Allison went to see their mother. When their stepfather saw her, he raised his hand, but Carter intercepted it. Seeing Carter, the mother said in confusion, Miller? No, Mom. This is your son with Dad. Will you come with us or stay with him? She nodded with hatred towards her stepfather. Mom silently hugged them both and cried. They put the apartment up for sale and in the meantime lived in Miller's house. Allison transferred to the local university for her fourth year. The Miller brothers and Charles spent most of their time in the wasteland. Morty, not expecting such a turn in his life, never leaves Carter's side, who often visits Robert. And he learns to communicate in their family. Robert claims he's doing well. They form a strong bond, Carter and Robert. But when Carter asked about Robert's last name, Robert said that he had no intention of changing the last name given to him at birth by his great-grandfather as he heroically died in the war. He believes that not everything in this world is forgivable. Thank you for joining us today on Deep Stories. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next video.